So how had the Democratic Party, traditionally the champion of workers uh, and and the poor, uh, come to identify so strongly with Wall Street? That that was a head turner, right? I mean, how did we get up here? What does the and what does the future of this party look like um, as the as the twenty first century uh, begins its next quarter? Um, I wanted to get into that, and my guest today. Um, has written a book about this very topic. Joshua Green is a national correspondent for Bloomberg Businessweek and the author of the new book, The Rebels. Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and the struggle for a new American politics. It's a great read because it really sets out um, a clear through line of the development of a progressive left within the Democratic Party. Uh, his book tells the story of this populist movement uh, that emerged on the left from the ashes of the 2008 financial crisis uh, and the three major stars that really helped shape this era, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, were a critical, essential ingredient uh, for the rise of this movement on the left uh, and set in motion uh, storylines that played out in the 2016 and the 2020 presidential cycle, but also will have a real important role to play in the upcoming 2024 cycle. So sit back, grab a, a favorite adult beverage or just a cup of coffee, and enjoy my conversation with Joshua Green coming up right here on the Michael Steele podcast right after this. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. Uh, what a great time right now to have this conversation because a lot of folks have been, you know, obviously and rightly focused on uh, the craziness that's in my party. Um, we have we have elevated bullshit to a whole nother level where it's not just politics. It's an art form. Um, but little noticed in in this this ramp up to Republican slash conservative slash MAGA populism is uh, what's been brewing on the left and uh, how the Democratic Party uh, has also uh, seen planted the, the same seeds, uh, although a little bit different, uh, of populism. And Joshua Green has written the book that I think kind of nails it and spells it out and makes it very clear uh, the political dynamics uh, that have not only uh, evolved to shape uh, this this form of populism, but will will really challenge, I think, the Democratic Party in the future. So it is a real pleasure to welcome you, Joshua, to the podcast to get into the meat of what you've written in this incredible book, The Rebels. Um, and it is um, a real treat to have you on uh, to have the conversation, man. Well, thanks so much for having me. Good to good to be joining you virtually. Yeah, exactly. But look, you don't look no worse for wear. Usually it's in person in, in the green room or on yeah, that's the right. studio. But, yeah. <laughs> well, you don't look any worse for wear for all, for trudging through Iowa and New Hampshire. And God bless you, you yeah. know, with all of that. But um, it's good to have you in the house today. I, I want to just get right uh, into it to sort of set the scene, if we will, if you will, um, <laughs> before we get into the meat of the players. Um, what was it, um, you lay out the, the, the events that sort of set the stage for the emergence of this populism. And I would say on, on both the right and the left, uh, yeah. and, and, and sort of really, uh, altered the trajectory of traditional Republican, traditional democratic politics as we knew it. Yeah, oh, well, my new book, The Rebels, is about Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, AOC, and the rise of that left-wing populism. And to me, uh, I date it to the to, to the aftermath of the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, that was the great disruptive political event in my adult lifetime. I've been in Washington 20 years. Right. I was there before as a Washington reporter, and I was there after. And that was sort of the pivot point on which history hinged. Um, if you look at the aftermath of the 08 crash, uh, my last book, Devil's Bargain, was about the rise of Steve Bannon, Donald yep. Trump, and, and right-wing populism. And you can draw a pretty clear line, the rise of the Tea Party, 
uh, the rise of, of, of Breitbart News, Bannon, the MAGA movement, and ultimately uh, Trump, who, who wound up in the White House. But the thesis of my new book is that the 08 crash also created this huge populist uprising on the left. And you saw that initially in, in things like the Occupy Wall Street movement. But to me, um, I was a I was a columnist for the Boston Globe back in those days. And so I'd gotten to know Elizabeth Warren, who was a, a Harvard law professor, mm -hmm. wasn't very well known, but uh, she got a job in Washington as the basically the the oversight cop of the Wall Street bailout, uh, the troubled asset relief program. And she used this frankly obscure and powerless position as a platform to launch this big uh, left populist indictment, uh, not just of Wall Street, but of Obama and mainstream Democrats. And I think sort of created a beachhead in the Democratic Party for a kind of left wing populism economics focus that maybe had existed in the 40s and 50s, but had kind of gone into remission in the 60s and 70s. Right. Liberalism turned more toward women's rights, civil rights, uh, environmentalism, that sort of thing. The financial crisis brought it roaring back. Uh, you know, and Warren, and then after her, Bernie and AOC really became uh, the figureheads of this movement that's reshaped democratic politics over the last fifteen years. But even that, even that origin story has an origin story because you <laughs> you really start the book in uh, nineteen seventy eight with Jimmy Carter. Yeah. yeah. Um, why? Why? Why, the, why was that? sort of like the the origin of the origin story great question great question so me as a reporter i'm just a curious guy i always want to know why 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 and i mentioned back in 08 09 i was a columnist for the boston globe that was my that was my side hustle right uh, my main job was, was we all gotta have that right gotta have a couple of those right you know um my my day job was actually as a political magazine i was a, a political writer at the atlantic monthly magazine and so i was embedded with tim geithner so i had this like really oh, yeah. weird yeah split screen image of how the how the government was responding to the financial crisis during the day i was hanging out with tim geithner in the treasury very pro wall street focused on recapitalizing the banks getting the economy growing again and then at night i'd go have a cup of coffee with warren and listen to her and she'd be like no this is the terrible thing that they're doing they should be focused on the middle class and so i sort of had this split screen image and to me the big question was why are Democrats so split over this? And why is Tim Geithner and Barack Obama so focused on the Wall Street element of this? How did the Democratic Party uh, come to be so concerned with Wall Street and kind of have the middle class on a little bit of the back burner? Mm -hmm. And so that curiosity led me back to Jimmy Carter's White House in 1978, because what I decided I needed to know was, how did Wall Street first get its claws into the Democratic Party? Exactly. And the answer turned out to be this fascinating and obscure um, fight in the Oval Office between Democrats and Wall Street back in 1978, uh, when Jimmy Carter was being buffeted with high inflation and low approval numbers, a lot of the same things that, that Joe Biden has been recently. And in desperation, the party rolled Carter, turned to Wall Street, and it set it on a trajectory, the Democratic Party, through the 80s and 90s, that more and more you began to see these Wall Street figures like Bob Rubin uh, not only funding the Democratic Party, which was important because Reagan had moved electoral politics onto television and that cost a lot of money. Right. But those guys also began to assume major positions in Democratic administrations like Treasury Secretary, top economic advisor, so that by the time you get to 2008, and the economy crashes. Uh, it's really Wall Street guys who are in charge of the recovery and what it looks like. And if you look at the years after that, there was so much uh, backlash on the left and the right because people really weren't helped enough by their recovery. Ordinary working people uh, that it really changed the contours of American politics. Um, and it created a lot of the anger and animosity, I think that continues to this day, but that was especially pronounced in the mid 2010s, so 2015, 2016, when you see the emergence of Bernie Sanders and you see the emergence of Donald Trump in that presidential race. But that's interesting because the Democrats weren't uh, noted for their, even even before Carter mm -hmm. and the 70, and I, I remember the 78, uh, 78, 79, uh, 80, uh, financial uh, economic burn, uh, burn down, you know, with high inflation. I remember when gas, went from 50 cents a gallon to a dollar gallon, a dollar a gallon, damn near lost my mind. You know, it's like, what <laughs> the hell? 
you know, it's cost a lot of money now to fill up my hoopty, you know, but <laughs> the but that was not a strain within the Democratic Party. There were the, the Democrats um were I mean I, maybe I'm off base, but I thought they were a little bit more agnostic on the whole Wall Street thing to begin with, because they're you know, they're part of the great society. So they're looking at the yeah. role of government and, and promoting societal change and and so forth. And so the this this idea that you have this this brewing battle within the party um over Wall Street essentially yeah. um well, was fast is fast is a fascinating storyline that you that you put your finger on. Yeah, and they didn't view it as a brewing battle uh, at first. What was so interesting to me was exactly as you said, from let's say the 1930s and 40s until maybe the mid 1970s, it was an era. It was an era of American history that historians call the Great Compression. Right. Uh, Democrats were very labor focused. Um, there, there, there wasn't the kind of gaping inequality we have today between CEO pay and worker pay. Right. Uh, what happened is in the 1970s, that started to break down. Uh, we had a pair of oil crises, we had inflation, and it became very difficult for the people in the Oval Office to figure out how to grapple with that. Um, you know, Carter, interestingly enough, uh, was a Southern Baptist and, and ran as a populist. And the story I tell in the opening chapter is, when he ran for president, he said, you know, the whole tax code is perverted in a way that favors Wall Street and rich people. There was a famous tax deduction that that Carter liked to rail against. It was a tax deduction for the three martini lunch. <laughs> I remember that. that. We all watched oh, my Mad God. But look, let me tell you how, how much work got done with that three martini lunch baby come on now i remember that yeah right. well see i i only I'm, I'm not old enough to remember it personally but i did watch mad men so i get a, <laughs> a sense of what it was like but, but to carter it was this great moral affront like why why does the american tax code give these breaks to, to rich drunken businessmen when as he liked to say the ordinary truck driver can't deduct his 50 cent sandwich I was like, how else do you think the economy is going to run that that drunken <laughs> businessman needs to <laughs> <laughs> so so he goes in and tries to zero out the tax code and rewrite it in a way that sort of right. benefits ordinary workers and it just didn't work and democrats were were panicking much as i think a lot of democrats are today they looked at inflation they looked at carter's unpopularity uh, and they realized like we don't really have any ideas to deal with this crisis and Wall Street and the business world had really just begun to organize in the 1970s. That's when you saw the emergence of the business roundtable. Mm -hmm. And so they very cleverly started lobbying Democratic congressmen back in their home districts and saying, you know what we need uh, is we need a bunch of tax breaks for businesses so that they'll create jobs and send the economy kind of skyrocketing. And basically what it was was kind of a pro-Wall Street Republican tax plan in disguise, but yeah. Democrats in Congress in their desperation said, you know what, we don't have anything better to do. We're going to go in this direction. <laughs> they rolled Jimmy Carter. Um, they still lost seats in, in the midterms. Yeah. But then after Carter lost to Reagan in 1980, the, the, the view among ambitious Democrats was that Jimmy Carter and everything he stood for was toxic. So if Carter is you know, anti-Wall Street, anti-business deduction, we're now going to be pro-business deduction. And so you see the rise of what was called, uh, you know, neoliberal Democrats or new Democrats in the 80s and 90s, who just took a much more pro-business. And that and that is where Bill Clinton comes in, uh, exactly. particularly with the DLC uh, faction within the Democratic Party, which ori reoriented uh, the party away from, ironically enough, um, they tried to hold on to this sort of populism socially. So yes. big government programs around education and health care and all of that. We saw uh, Clinton sort of advocate that with his wife, uh, uh, then First Lady. Uh, uh, what's her name again? <laughs> Hillary Clinton. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. A lot, a lot of people have tried to put her out of yeah, there. Yeah, right, right, right. No, no, I always have fun with Hillary. But the, re the reality of it is Hillary... Um, you know, tried that. So they, they, they was a little homage to that. But then there was this other side, this other strain of, of, of populism, well, not populism, of sort of traditional emerging Repub uh, Repub quasi-Republican uh, policymaking around mm -hmm. Wall Street. And you note, you note that, you know, um, the, the sort of neoliberal faith in, in uh, the market's ability to provide for um, uh, these things that the economy needed sort of 
sort of hid away or sort of masked this this notion uh, that people at the top were actually benefiting far more than uh, everyone else. And that kind of sets up the narrative that would play itself out um, some 15 or so years later, uh, by the time you get to 2008 and the crash and the emergence yeah. of the thinking of an Elizabeth Warren and a Bernie Sanders uh, and an Ocasio-Cortez. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the idea with New Democrats, it, it wasn't that they were, you know, evil money grubbers secretly doing Wall Street's bidding. That's sort of like the left wing cartoon version of them. What it really was, was a philosophy that said, listen, we still believe in liberal social goals and helping people, but we think that the best way to do that is to let the market take the lead, uh, you know, and, and to kind of defer to free market forces. Uh, and what that meant in practice was things like, financial deregulation. You know, Bill Clinton abolished Glass-Steagall, which separated investment banking from commercial banking, and all sorts of millions of little changes in the code that kind of favored Wall Street. Uh, the problem is that when, as we discovered, when you take that to an extreme and you kind of loosen um, the regulatory limits of what banks are allowed to do, uh, they go crazy and crash the economy. <laughs> That's yeah. exactly what happened in 2008 and 2009. Uh, and that really is the, the, the kind of the beginning of my story in The Rebels. Uh, Warren had spent her academic career studying bankruptcy and sort of studying the way that predatory um, credit card companies, Wall Street firms kind of preyed on, on, on poor people. So she's very alert, A, to the importance of, of kind of financial regulation, but B, to what had actually gone wrong and what was the effect it was having on ordinary middle class people. And, you know, Obama's approach, which is largely informed, I think, by, by Geithner and a lot of his Wall Street advisors was, look, we're trying to fight off a Great Depression. We need to take all of this TARP, this bailout money, uh, and we need to use it to recapitalize banks or else our economy is going to go bust and, and put us into a depression. Uh, and I, I go through, uh, you know, I, I was, in, like I said, I was embedded with Tim Geithner at the time. So I have like really vivid up close um, you know, kind of fly on the wall reporting in the book of, of why he did what he did, why Obama did what they did. They thought it was the best and cheapest way to, to bail America out of this crisis, get the economy growing in a way in, in a way that would help everybody. Uh, but clearly that that just didn't happen. I mean, there wasn't enough money in the stimulus. It wasn't focused on middle class people. And Warren used that platform to become this kind of not just this important political figure, but a cultural figure, too. Um, you know, I tell the story of how Jon Stewart and The Daily Show, right. which were like the hottest show on television back then. He's uh, coming back. Stewart, of course, is coming back. Now. He's coming yeah. back. You know, my boy is coming, coming back. back. <laughs> but he was he was sort of like, you know, the Walter Cronkite for like kind of, you know, hip, yeah. liberal yeah. Plugged in people in like 2008, 2009. That was before TikTok. Before the like TV audience had kind of balkanized, everybody who was like hip and wanted to be with it watched Jon Stewart every night. He really made Warren into this American cultural star and gave her a platform to kind of tout these ideas that said, hey, this isn't right what Obama and the Democrats are doing. Right. Deferring too much to Wall Street. And then once she got elected senator, turns out Warren has amazing talent for just doing these kind of public hearings where she grills and beats down uh, her witnesses, whether it's like, um, you know, a misbehaving Wall Street CEO or Tim Geithner, the Treasury Secretary. And, you know, she was really one of the first politicians to discover that you can use social media to go viral. Nobody, you know, YouTube right. was new back then. iPhones were new back then. And Warren was the one who would create these big fights that would get clipped and go rocketing around the Internet. And it gave her real political force. And it kind of built up this movement behind her where all of a sudden, as you remember, guys in the media like me were talking about the Elizabeth Warren wing of the Democratic Party. That became yeah. a thing. And it, it did it, become a thing. And, and it led to um, some real tensions between her and the administration. Absolutely. The Secretary, uh, Mr. Geithner, talk to us a little bit about uh, how uh, that uh emerged i mean what and what were the results of their butting heads um over that 2008 financial crisis well i mean geithner and his people i think obama's people generally most of them were were just sort of dumbfounded that this liberal harvard professor who was a democrat and they thought should be an ally can i put a little, a little pin right there but yeah. before she was this liberal 
Democrat. She was a Republican. Oh, yeah, yeah. Back in yeah. <laughs> this is what I try to get people to understand. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, so being a coming, you know, as a young woman coming through as a as a Republican, there is an underpinning there of philosophy, right? Yeah. So it's not like you just turn the switch off. I'm no longer this Republican sort of, you know, New England kind of, you know, moderate Republican yep. and suddenly become this, you know, liberal. But the, you can see a through line in some of the arguments that she would make. Yes, um, she had a, as a senator. Fast, fascinating biographical journey. And I, t you know, I tell the story in the book. She was born in Oklahoma um, <clears throat> for a while, was a, a, a law professor at the University of Houston and always lived in the South. And wound up specializing in bankruptcy law. And when she came into academia, the thought in bankruptcy law was like, if you declare bankruptcy, um, you're probably a lazy, good for nothing person right. who, who just <laughs> overspends. And you that, need to get your butt That's still kind of the view that people have. It was literally the view, not just kind of in the in the country, but but among academia. So what Warren and a few of her colleagues did, and this became a, a seminal um, academic book that she wrote was, they went all across the country from courthouse to courthouse, pulling people's bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy filings and seeing, okay, what made these people declare bankruptcy? And what they discovered was that more often than not, it was not that they were spend, you know, uh, um, um, overly, overly, what do you call it? <laughs> <laughs> that they were loose with their spending. spending right they were loose with their spending right it was that they had had some kind of a, a medical event a job loss just an ordinary you know kind of kind of personal financial tragedy that had cast them uh into into that position a lot of times it was you know uh credit cards that they'd signed up for or mortgages right. that had that had kind of tricked them and failed and that really changed the way that Warren viewed not just bankruptcy law, but politics generally. She began to see that a lot of these financial firms and banks were actually predatory lenders who were taking advantage of middle class people who weren't sophisticated about this side of, side of stuff, plunging them into bankruptcy. And so that sort of radicalized Warren in a leftward direction that she brought to her job as Wall Street bailout cop, you know, as, as she's watching all of these Wall Street banks, which of course had had these no interest loans and subprime right. mortgages. We all remember the things that crashed the economy. Oh my God, oh, yes. Wait, these people. are the bad guys. Why are we, you know, why are we rushing in with an $800 billion bailout? And instead of giving it to the middle class who's been victimized, we're giving it to the bad guys. And so by the time Warren had reached that point, uh, she was a very you know, economically populist uh, left-wing figure. And she used her platform to sort of evangelize on behalf of those ideas, which no big surprise here, like had a lot of purchase and got a lot of interest in the years after the financial crisis, when everybody was looking around and had lost a job or a mortgage or their retirement account had crashed. And they look and see that Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and Citigroup and all these guys have been bailed out. And meanwhile, where are the jobs, right? It took seven years after the 08 crisis for the American economy to recover its job. And People were angry about that. And, and the funny thing is, you know, I was embedded with Geithner at the time. And you could see toward the end of the six months, I was embedded with him. There's a scene in the book where, if you remember, um, Massachusetts Senator Ted Kennedy had tragically mm -hmm. died of, of, of brain cancer. And yep. there was a special election to replace him. Yep. I, uh, I remember that's when I became chairman. Yeah, yeah. completely yeah. thought they would win because it's Massachusetts, right? Yep. And instead, Scott Brown, a Republican, won that race. And it was this wake-up call um, for Democrats and for Geithner in particular, I was in his office and he, when he was sort of realizing, he's like, he thought of himself and he thought of Obama and the Democrats as being these heroes who through their policies had sort of kept the economy from collapsing into a depression, which in, in, in a sense, he was right about that. They, they did manage to avoid the worst outcomes in the crisis. But what he was just then realizing was there was this political backlash that people were really really angry at Democrats. They didn't consider them heroes. They considered them villains for giving right. all the money away. And Scott Brown's election as a Republican in Massachusetts was the first sign of that. Now, I and my like naivete sitting there with him thought, well, you know, it's going to be bad next election cycle, right? But then people kind of get over it. Like, how crazy could things get, right? No. He wound up being <laughs> crazy no. enough that the country elected Donald Trump president, who, you know, was elected in part because he was just this angry, vindictive guy who promised to smash back at the political establishment in both parties, who'd kind of immiserated the country. And that was 
and I think remains to a degree, but certainly back in 2015, 2016, that was a powerful political message. Bernie Sanders had a lot of the same message, minus the the racism and the xenophobia. Um, you know, but what was Bernie Sanders if not like a walking well, indictment? That's, Wall right, and that's what I want to get to because you you, you the storyline which you've laid out very well uh, from seventy eight uh, to that moment where Elizabeth Warren is able to encapsulate the, and, and really push forward this, this emerging um, progressive uh, view of, of democratic policies, economic policies, certainly re reimagining the relationship of between the party and Wall Street, which, mm. which had been sort of fixed um in a post Carter uh and and certain Clinton certainly Clinton uh period to something very very different and so uh by the time you get to 2015 you have emerging within um the Democratic Party because largely of the, the because of the work Elizabeth Warren had been doing her battle with Geithner mm -hmm. um you know and and so and sort of um, trying to reframe uh, the economic crisis uh, up uh, from her perspective um, mm -hmm. to to look at the impact and solutions on behalf of the working class, not towards the more traditional, oh, we got to give it to the guys who generate the economy and the money because that's how they create the jobs. But her argument was, well, they're the problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so why don't we give the money to the people, which uh, fast forward a little bit was what the whole COVID uh, solution was under Donald Trump, ironically enough. But in between that, you just put your finger on the emergence of, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders sort of reflecting um, in a in a political sense, this antipathy towards Wall Street. Talked about talk about his emergence now in this period, yeah, um, and, and how that set the stage for even a clash between him and Warren for the mantle that would set up a presidential run as the flag bearer of this new progressive uh, populism within the Democratic Party. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And so I tell in, in the Rebels, I tell the story through these three characters, Warren, Bernie, and AOC, but I do it chronologically because that's kind of how it played out in real time. Right. If you go back to 2009 with Warren's emergence, with Warren's emergence, you know, clearly this big figure who just built up this this head of steam uh, and this political power. She got elected senator in 2012. And, you know, within a year or so, there were multiple draft Elizabeth Warren for president movements. And, you know, the big question in Democratic politics at the time was, because we all knew that Hillary was going to run, was will Elizabeth Warren challenge Hillary Clinton um, for the Democratic nomination in 2016? Right. A lot of pressure, a lot of talk between Warren's advisors. In the end, she sort of teased that she would and got everybody all excited. And, you know, all these groups kind of started up and they, they actually hired staff and New Hampshire and I with these draft Warren movements. And then at the very last moment, she says, yeah, I'm not going to do it. And what happened was Sanders, you know, as, as a as a left populist, was kind of waiting in the wings to see if Warren would run or not. When she decided not to, he got into the race. And immediately these draft Warren groups sort of changed their banner. Right. To, <laughs> yeah, from run Warren, run Warren, put in Sanders. Run Bernie run. And so you had this kind of infrastructure of <clears throat> Warren type populist left Democrats who were all excited to participate in the 2016 Democratic primary. And now they had their candidate in Bernie Sanders. And, you know, the story, I, I think, in my book, and I, I lived this in real time, was just this consistent surprise at every stage how powerful these ideas turned out to be, right? 2009, right. when Warren became TARP oversight cop, nobody thought that she was going to emerge as this big popular figure. When Bernie Sanders got into the race in, in early 2016, nobody thought that Bernie was going to be this, this huge guy who was going to fill arenas because right. he was 
he wasn't new to people in Washington. He'd been a congressman, a backbencher. I was going to say he's a total backbencher, yeah. It was it was viewed as like a weirdo and a gadfly. Like he wasn't the lovable Bernie meme guy that he right. became after he ran for president. He was just viewed as a left-wing crank. Um, but when he ran and started articulating these themes, especially in contrast to his opponent, Hillary Clinton, it just it had such resonance that within a month of his declaring, he went from you know, rallies of 100, 200 people to filling arenas of like three, four, 5,000 people. And part of the story I tell in the book is, is Sanders and his staff being like, what in the hell is going on here? Like, <laughs> like, as it's dawning on them that like, they're really connecting and this huge movement is sprouting up. Right. And so, you know, in, in the end, Bernie didn't quite win the Democratic nomination, but he wound up, you know, winning 23 states, uh, raising hundreds of millions of dollars. He raised more money than Hillary Clinton did. Um, and he sort of made it clear that regardless of whether Clinton wins or loses, this new left populist wing is sticking around. And it's not just it's not just limited to Elizabeth Warren. Bernie Bernie supplanted her as sort of the figurehead of this movement. But everybody could see right. now that this was going to be an important part of the Democratic uh, Party and the Democratic coalition going forward. And then when Clinton lost to Donald Trump, another populist, um, I think people were so horrified uh, in democratic circles and asking themselves, what had we done wrong that we could lose to a guy like this, that it really caused well, a kind of self appraisal among Democrats. And you saw the party immediately begin to lurch in kind of a left direction where Warren and Bernie are now elevated into democratic well, Senate leadership. But here's the problem, the self appraisal, this, this is, this is, this isn't deep navel gazing stuff here. <laughs> you lost because you didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. It's not complicated. The progressive look, dude. I remember being no. with the, uh, no. I remember right, right. Being, yes, but why? But why didn't they vote for Hillary Clinton? Because she was giving speeches to Goldman Sachs. Well, because, what the hell do you think Donald Trump was doing? Well, but he was out I mean, there as I mean, he was literally. Everybody forgets this now. Everybody forgets this now. And yes, Trump ran against immigrants and Muslims and that sort of thing. But half of his spiel yes. back then was running against Wall Street. Exactly. Against- it was the it was the completion of the circle. So there were and yeah. I was go- I was going to that exact point. Okay. There was this thing called the Bernie Sanders Donald Trump voter. And they yes. existed yeah. in real time. And the Democrats chose to ignore them. I remember being at the Democratic National Convention on the Wednesday before Hillary's acceptance speech on Thursday and talking to five women from California who were pissed as hell about what was happening on the floor. They just left the hall yep. and they just con- reconfigured the rules to block Bernie Sanders' opportunity to get the nomination. They were pissed. So I'm standing there talking to them and they were like ranting. So of course, it led to an obvious question, Josh. So yeah. who are you guys going to vote for? Yeah. Yeah. And not only one <laughs> out of the five women said that they would vote for Hillary Clinton if she yeah. actually turned out to be the nominee, that they were planning to vote for for Donald Trump. Largely out of protest, yes, but yeah. also because of the thing which you talk touch on in the book, and that is this the emergence of this, of this populism that overlaps, that this yeah. whole anti-Wall Street, anti-big government, anti sort of you know um the way we always traditional way we did things was being supplanted in both parties by this emerging populism that was represented by bernie sanders and donald trump uh in that cycle and i always contended if bernie sanders had probably another three to four weeks in that primary he would have been the nominee of the party because you could see the party moving more and more towards him which created this pressure yeah. on what was then the Obama wing of the party to protect this, and, and Hillary Clinton, obviously, to protect the, the established order of things. And that's when they started putting their fingers on the scale and all the machinations inside yep. the DNC began to unfold. So you're ex- you, you really get into that storyline. So it's important for people to understand that th- these were two sides of the same coin, just as we'd seen eight years before with Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party, because they were two sides That's of the exactly exact right. same coin. That's exactly right. And the way I think of it, just the most basic level, is, is anti-establishment. That right. the people in both parties were just sick of the same old Republican establishments. So, you know, 
I think what happened with a lot of people, I go through some of the some of the hard numbers in the book. It wasn't just uh, I mean, it wasn't just Clinton fans like the women right. that you ran into, but also, you know, especially in the industrial Midwest and in these critical swing states like Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, there was a group of people, you know, a lot of them were sort of middle aged working class white men who had been for Bernie in the primaries and wound up voting for Donald Trump in large enough numbers that it tilted those three states. So in that circle, there really is an overlap between the populist left and the populist right that you can see all the way up until today with steel tariffs, right? Donald Trump put them, or Donald Trump put them in place, or China tariffs. Uh, you know, Joe Biden has, has kind of kept them. But back then, back in 2016, the Clinton people, I don't think ever took Sanders seriously as, as an opponent. And so they didn't take his movement seriously and thought, listen, all we really need to do is amass enough de delegates to win the nomination, which they did. We don't really need to pay attention to his message. And so, you know, they, like a lot of other people, were blindsided by the fact that Donald Trump won in 2016. Uh, and a lot of it, I do think, was due to, very true, Hillary Clinton didn't get enough votes. I think part of the reason she didn't get enough votes was because she didn't recognize and embrace this, this rising element of populism in her own party. And a lot of people who felt a connection to that brand of populism wound up going for the candidate in 2016 who they thought did represent it, and that wound up being Donald Trump. Yes, and Lord, have we paid a price for that since then. The, <laughs> the, the, the book is The Rebels, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and the Struggle for a New American Politics. Uh, the author the author is the, the incredibly uh, good uh, storyteller, writer, um, and uh, correspondent, Joshua Green. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we want to talk about the rise of one Ocasio-Cortez and the the pressure on Joe Biden uh, to show some of his own populist uh, wings here. Uh, we'll be back with Joshua right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the Michael Steele podcast. Um, having a great conversation, sort of a deep dive into uh, the the uh, political psyche and development of a progressive uh, wing with uh, within the Democratic Party um, outlined in the book The Rebels by Joshua Green. Uh, so Joshua, I, I want to get into we, we talked about the emergence of of Warren, uh, the rise of the backbencher uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, and then the new generation now. Uh, has come to the table, um, not only in um, a, a different fashion than we typically see in Washington, but with a higher degree of demands and a willingness to use uh, the outside infrastructure, uh, social media, et cetera, uh, to press their points. And, and that was never more noted than in the person of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez the congresswoman from New York. Tell us a little bit about that story and the emergence of her role in this new American politics. Yeah, I mean, to me, the fascinating thing or the, the like the most historically noteworthy thing about AOC is that she represents a kind of generational passing of the torch, right? We've talked about this emergence of left-wing populism after the crisis, um, but it's it's two uh, kind of chief avatars were, were Warren and Bernie, who were much, much older. Uh, Ocasio-Cortez is so interesting because she was really brought into national politics by Bernie Sanders. She was a Bernie Sanders uh, campaign staffer, volunteer, got very interested in organizing that way. That's what prompted her to run for office. Uh, it helped that she also turned out to be, I think, a generationally talented politician and communicator. Um, you know, but but she sort of burst onto the scene by defeating Joe Crowley, the New York congressman, mm -hmm. who everybody in Washington expected to be the next Democratic Speaker of the House, the success yeah. of Nancy Pelosi. And the idea that this young Latina woman and her band of, of justice Democrat, social Democrat um, organizers uh, had figured out how to organize and beat this guy was just blew everybody's minds. And she herself was such a dynamic figure, um, both in her use of social media, but also just in her radicalness and willingness to kind of cha uh, cha challenge democratic establishment norms, uh, that she instantly just seized the spotlight, uh, not just the media spotlight, but also I think because she was young, female, and Latina, the conservative media spotlight too, and just became um, 
sort of politically like the Taylor Swift of, of 2018. I mean, is all anybody talked about. Right. Like she began, you know, she began her Washington tenure even before she was sworn in by occupying Nancy Pelosi's office. Yeah. Uh, not not one of the wisest moves she could make as a young congresswoman, right? Or maybe, no? maybe not. But if, if you want to get the attention of, of, you know, the nation and the national political press corps, that's a pretty good way to do it. And, yeah. and she definitely did. Um yeah, story I tell in, in the Rebels of Ocasio Cortez is sort of where she came from, how she, how she did this, but also her political evolution in Washington from you know a radical uh, kind of activist who would occupy the Speaker's office to someone who gradually learned the way that power works in Washington and in Congress and, and managed to very cleverly, I think, bend her skills toward things like oversight hearings and focusing her social media following on specific issues and specific campaigns, you know, in a way that's allowed her to emerge is certainly the most prominent member um, of her congressional class. But really, right. I think one of the more, more, if not the most prominent young Democrat there is, period, since so many Democrats are over 70, over 80, and like not just a generation older, but two generations older. Yeah, she she emerged very much as this this new voice uh, for a progressive form of politics that certainly elicited uh, a response from the right. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about that. She became, in many respects, the the updated 21st century version of Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. So the fixation that Republicans had on Hill for on Hillary for 30 years. Uh, sort of transferred, I'm sure, much to Hillary's great relief, uh, onto AOC um, as she began, as you as you noted, uh, to um, press the system in Washington in a way that uh, a yeah caught attention, but b ultimately taught her how to actually press it the right way uh to sort of get to get some things done and so she was able to sort of focus her her um ire her her firepower on Trump on on um uh, a lot of the things that uh emerged uh after 2015 2016 election um in a way that i would say kind of took some some of the the heat off of uh, the Demo on, on the Democratic side, you have the creation of the squad, the the, the four yeah. members, the younger uh, women uh, in Congress who uh, sort of banded together um, to sort of raise up these issues. Uh, and again, focusing the firepower on the right on them as opposed to more broadly uh, Democrats. Talk about that, dy that dynamic and how it uh, elicited... Um, uh, a positive response inside the Democratic Party for um, sort of creating this message line, these through lines that actually resonated with voters that the Democrats would need. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the key in, 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 on both sides of that coin is that they were uh, young women of color, basically. And that was something, if you look at the leadership of the Democratic Party, generally it tends to be old, white, and geriatric. And what you had in AOC and the squad was this exciting, dynamic, uh, you know, new brand of, of of younger legislators who, frankly, looked more like the Democratic base, which is heavily minority, is, you know, does include like a lot of young people. Most young people still vote Democratic, uh, even though we have some polls showing that they're moving to Trump. Uh, I think on, on, on the left, that was very exciting. They also stood for a kind of radical brand of politics. You know, this, these social Democrats um, didn't really have much representation in Congress before the squad came along. But that spoke very much, I think, to the political inclinations of a lot of young left-leaning people. And on the right, I think the fact that they were young people of color made them representative or, or targets of the kind of cultural panic that Donald Trump's version of Republicanism had kind of ginned up in the years after 2016. Republicans, Fox News, were no longer chiefly concerned with getting tax cuts for the rich, or at least that's not what they like talking about on TV and talk right. radio. They were interested in focusing on issues like uh, immigration and radical socialists, all that sort of thing. And uh, Ocasio-Cortez in particular, because she was so outspoken 
uh, and, and such an effective and invisible communicator, I think, became the target of that ire in a way that just night after night after night, if you turn into Fox News, that's what they were talking about. That's who they were talking about. And the fact also that AOC, you know, back before Twitter broke, was so willing to kind of hop online and go to war with these people, uh, I think helped kind of generate these news cycles that made her one of the central characters. Yeah, you, it, it so much so that by the time you get to uh, the 2020 election, you have Biden running as a quasi populist, um, yeah. recognizing, as you note in the book, you know that um, this this is an emerging force within his own party that he's going to need. He's going to need to know how to navigate that, as well as navigate the mainstream of America, but also deal with what has emerged on the right. Uh, as this this white nationalist um, aggressive form of of conservative populism that uh, actually is, is is ripping at the fabric of the country, um, and and it, it surprised people uh, that that Biden would lean into the sort of Warren Sanders economic populism, uh, given his as you note his more centrist corporate friendly. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. you know, uh, background. How how has this shaped? Because it's going to be, the, you know, ultimately, and we'll get into this in a moment, it is going to be a narrative stream within this 2024 cycle, yeah. uh, particularly given what the president and his team were able to accomplish <laughs> on infrastructure and, and um, sort of staving off the financial collapse um, of the economy with the inflation bill, et cetera. Yeah. Um, how 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 did and and what was the the sort of the mental uh, jujitsu that that Biden had to do to actually kind of land? <laughs> so you know, sort of teetering a little bit in space yeah. um, on this on this you know sort of center left populism, yeah, um, uh, but not going so far as an AOC. Uh, no, it's, a, it's a great question. So look, to, to me, the reason I wrote this book is because I, I think that I wanted to talk about and I, and I wanted to capture the historical importance of these three characters, Warren, Bernie and AOC, and how they've changed um, uh, not just Democratic politics in the party, but the country over the last 15 years. Um, to me, the clearest sign of that change you know, as 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 pundits and reporters, Mike, you know, you and I like a lot, a lot of the game is sort of talking about who's running for president, who wins right. the nomination, whatever. But the way American politics really works, it's not just who wins the presidency is, is how does the country change? How does the policy change? How does what the government do? You know, who are the winners and, and losers? Who's who's affected? Who you know, who, who comes out ahead? Who comes out behind? I think the real measure of influence of my three characters and of, of this left wing populism in general is that if you go back to the beginning of the story in 2008, uh, you see how the Democratic Party behaves. And let's remember who was in the White House then. Joe Biden. Joe Biden, right. Who, you know, when I came to Washington, Biden was was nicknamed the senator from corporate America. You know, he's from right. Delaware, where a lot of corporations are. He was sort of the leading pro-business, pro-corporate Democrats. So literally the antithesis of someone like Elizabeth Warren. And I've seen in the book early on, you know, when Warren was testifying before Congress, she'd be fighting with, with Biden and Biden would be kind of, you know, demeaning her because he's defending these credit card companies. If you flash forward to the 2020 um, Democratic primaries uh, and just after Biden was elected, you can measure the effect that my characters have had just by looking at the sea change in what Joe Biden did and what he was talking about. Yeah. I think Biden wisely embraced a lot of the economic populism that my three characters had, had espoused while rejecting some of the more extreme, uh, you know, uh, cultural left wing stuff on, on defund the police, um, on, on immigration, that sort right. of thing. You know, he adopted what was best about their platform, and he instituted that as president in 2020. And so instead of a very Wall Street focused bailout like we got in 2008, 2009 recovery uh, that wasn't really focused on the middle class, you look at what happened at, after the COVID crash, which was even worse and even deeper. And it's like a menu list of items that Elizabeth Warren was pushing for back in 2009, right? So multiple rounds of stimulus, right. not given to Goldman Sachs, but given to you know, people in the middle class. 
You had student loan freezes, eviction moratoriums, uh, a ton of small business loans. So mom and pop businesses, you remember the PPP loans and all those acronyms, uh, everything focused in the middle class. And lo and behold, within two years of that COVID crash, America had recovered all the jobs that it had lost. Unemployment today is as low as it was back in the Eisenhower administration. Stock market is at record levels. Economic sentiment has turned around, you know, low for a while because of the high inflation that came along with it. But if you look at just the actual economic numbers, uh, and if you look at what Biden has embraced, this idea of reshoring manufacturing and trying to build new electric vehicle factories or battery factories in the parts of America that were deindustrialized and that really gave Trump his victory in 2016, I think what you see is kind of the wholesale adoption of a lot of the economic populist ideas that Warren Sanders right. and AFC have all fought for, and also some of the environmental ones. I mean, you mentioned you mentioned the uh, Inflation Reduction Act was right. one of Biden's big landmark achievements. Um, you know, but AOC has pushed on the Green New Deal, pushed for environment. That was one of her big causes. You know, buried within the IRA is the largest climate bill the U.S. has ever passed, $300 billion for climate. And I think that's a measure of her influence and also Biden's recognition that, listen, I need to be where the center of the Democratic Party is. You know, back in right. 2008, that was in a very pro-market kind of pro-Wall Street place. But now in 2020 and now in 2024, it's at a much, much different place where the focus has to be on the middle class. It has to be on the areas left behind, uh, you know, and it has to be in states like Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. that are, They've decided the last two elections and are going to decide this election, too. And so in a lot of ways, um, just to just to finish off with 2024, I think that it's pretty clear now we're going to have Donald Trump versus Joe Biden right. in the general election. W what that's really going to represent, I think, is a battle between uh, the right wing vision of populism uh, and a more left leaning vision, um, you know, as represented by Biden. Yeah, I, I, I see that. And it's interesting. You mentioned the IRA and, and uh, you know, Republicans voted for that, by the way, folks, just so we, you know, for the record are clear. Uh, bipartisan IRA. It yeah. was by, by it was a bipartisan measure, very much like the you know um, uh, in, infrastructure bill was bipartisan, and the budget uh, decisions were bipartisan. And so all the you know the crap you're hearing now uh, from members of my party around uh, the immigration and border uh, legislation, again, I think reflects um, a couple of things. Biden's ability to weave, and this is this is one of my takeaways from your book about Biden, is his ability to understand the moment he finds himself in. Mm -hmm. So two thousand, this is two thousand eight. He was in a different position. He was the incoming vice president of the United States, um, so his role was not the same as it would be as the incoming president of the United States with COVID. So. Uh, so he understands the the moment he he is in uh, to such a degree that he's able to knit together the better parts of these competing interests, these competing ideas, which is why during that cycle, I always often refer to Joe Biden as a transitional president, that he would not only transition us hopefully off of Trumpism, but he would transition the country into a different generational thinking around uh, a number of these big policy, because he'd have to confront a lot of things, largely uh, democratic, you know, the role of democracy, but also um, particularly with the with the COVID crisis and other things, uh, that kind of pressure. So he's been able to do that. This election in 2024 is going to test that proposition, I think. Yeah, because you're one of the one of the end games that you you talk that you get to uh, is that Warren and Sanders and AOC, you know, they they each in their own way tried to pull and and to a large degree did pull the Democratic Party back towards, you know, it, you know, or tried to pull it back towards its, you know, vision or idea of what it is to be a Democrat and what we believe in, you know, the mm -hmm. working class, the poor and all of that. But there's also this recognition that you need a little bit of, you need a little bling to get all that ish done, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you, you got to pay for it. So you, you, you can't completely like, 
Wall Street, right? Just kind of yeah. stab him and kill him and put him aside. Um, that's gonna that's gonna be a very interesting competition of ideas versus the sort of the grievous policy uh, politics that we see on the right. Everybody's pissed. Yeah. Everybody's mad. It's everybody else's fault. Woe is me. You know, uh, let's blow it all up. How does Biden knit a 2024 reelection, um, given that, yes, he's kind of gotten the, the agreement, if you will, amongst his progressive uh, uh, wing, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much on his side. But are they really fully all in? Because they're not happy about Israel, Palestine. Yeah. Um, they some are suspect about Ukraine. So you still see that sort of bleeding over from the the bullshit that's coming from MAGA yeah. into these other areas that like we saw in 2008, where the circle is trying to con connect itself yeah. uh, as it did uh, with Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump back in 2016. Yeah, I, I think the challenge for Biden, as you laid out, is that you know he's got to reassemble this coalition that 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 he did in 2020. And when it comes to the left populace, I you know I, I don't think that the party is anywhere near as as dependent on Wall Street as it was a generation ago. Because right. one thing that I agree. Elizabeth Warren, Bernie, and AOC all proved is they can raise as much money or more than you can get from Wall Street. And so you have things like Act Blue, the small dollar fundraising. They're just these gushers of money yeah. for Democratic candidates. Yeah. Yeah. The Republicans are now envious of. So on the money front, I think Biden's going to be OK. I think the challenge for Biden is going to be, as you'd mentioned, there are issues beyond um, the economy that are roiling the Democratic Party. Uh, Israel and Hamas being one of them, um, uh, Ukraine being another. Uh, and it's it's you have to add to that the dysfunctional Congress, the, the, the fact that nothing can kind of really get through with, with split control in Washington. And so I think what Biden needs to do to win is to keep young people, uh, keep progressives on board while at the same time not losing the appeal that he had to people in the Midwest who might have voted for Trump in 2016, but switched over to Biden in 2020. And I think a great focus of Biden's presidency uh, has been exactly that in directing you know, resources and money and new factories and trying to revive uh, you know, the manufacturing economy in the sorts of places that have traditionally been neglected and turned against uh, incumbent establishment politicians. And I think 2024 will be a measure of whether or not Joe Biden has succeeded in doing that. So as I uh, let you get ready to go on and, and uh sell the book because <laughs> uh, I know you're out there uh, working hard to to get the book in front of folks. And I, I really want to, you know, let those who enjoy this podcast know this is a good one, folks. Um, you, you definitely want to take it down. If you enjoyed the book on, on, on Bantam, the devil's bargain, um, you're, you're going to love this one. Um, uh, particularly if you have an interest in the progressive politics uh, of the G of the uh, democratic party, um, how does this end? How, how how does the how does a new beginning emerge in a post Biden uh, Democratic great, party? Great question. I, I think a lot, almost everything, depends on twenty twenty four and who wins. If Joe Biden wins re-election, then I think he really does become the transitional figure you talked about. He'll have showed that you know a a, a, a Democratic platform focused on the middle class, focused on things like reshoring manufacturing jobs. Uh, you know, is, is enough to win and pass the baton to somebody else. And the fact that he'll have successfully navigated the COVID crash and done so um, using the powers of government very actively in the economy in a way that Democrats of the past generations wouldn't have wouldn't have been willing to, um, I think will be a kind of a proof of concept that future Democratic politicians will will take up, whether it's somebody like AOC, maybe she wants to run for president, or I think more likely uh, another um, more mainstream Democratic figure, maybe somebody like a Raphael Warnock in Georgia or a Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan. Mm -hmm. I think you'll, you'll you'll see the transition be you know to those kinds of figures. But really, this brand of left populism, I think, will become centered in Democratic politics in a way that makes it enduring. So, um, but it, on the other hand, if Biden loses, well, I was going to say, what happens if he loses? It's going to be like a Jimmy Carter situation where everybody's going to turn around and and blame those policies and say, you know, we're never going to do that again. And I think that'd be a real tragedy for the country, given how well these things have worked economically. Yeah, it, it'll be a very interesting 
uh, storyline. I, I have warned Democrats and will continue to warn them because I believe this is true. Um, your Tea Party is coming. <laughs> Trust me, you, you, you have a standing invitation to the Tea Party. It is coming. It is there. The seeds are there. And I think you're exactly right because of what we saw and what I personally saw firsthand as national chairman after the loss in 06, the, the cleaning of uh, the ranks of Republicans um, across the board, state and federal level, uh, and then the loss of, of the presidential in 2008, there was this emerging frustration uh, with big government republicanism as as uh, put in play by the Bush administration to you know deal with the war, uh, no child left behind. Uh, you just go through the 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 list of things that that fed this frustration within the GOP that would emerge uh, that April of uh, 09 um, in the the voice of a Tea Party. Um, in my first meeting with them, where they basically ripped me a new one as national chairman, uh, and I had to, I had to check them on a few things. <laughs> that that's that's uh, that's going to be in my book. But the, <laughs> but the um, but the reality of it is, this is to the to the last point, Josh. Um, if Biden loses, the recrimination battle begins, and yeah. the, and. Um, uh, we weren't progressive enough. He wasn't progressive enough. The country, the country, really wants us to care uh, openly about the poor and the working man and woman, um, and we need to be that party. And it'll be very fascinating to see how uh, the more mainstream Democrats, you know, uh, the governor of Michigan, the governor of Pennsylvania, for example, uh, competes with the the next generation of elizabeth warren and bernie sanders mm -hmm. it'll be fun it will I'll i got my popcorn baby that'll be the next book yeah that'll be the next book. and i and i got your book the rebels to help at least me help me understand what i'm watching as it unfolds uh good, not good. just to, not just in this cycle but in the future joshua green author of new york the new york time number one bestseller devil's bargain has another bestseller on his hand. It is called The Rebels, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and the struggle for a new American politics. Man, I enjoyed this conversation. It was really, really good. It's a great read. Um, and I really encourage folks to pick up a copy uh, to sort of get a better understanding of exactly what you're, what you're seeing unfold because there's a through line. Uh, as Josh pointed out, that goes back uh, back to the 1970s. So, thanks so much for having me, Michael. Enjoyed it. Absolutely, absolutely. Always. Well, that does it for this time together, folks. Uh, I'm really glad you could take a moment and pause with us and and uh, get a, get a feel from Joshua on on his book, The Rebels. Uh, pick up a copy, uh, certainly wherever you get your books from, uh, and and enjoy the read. Uh, in the meantime. Uh, share this uh, podcast with folks so folks can also learn about uh, what Josh has uh, done here with his book uh, and uh, do the download thing. You know, it makes me feel good inside when you do. So just do it just because you love me. <laughs> if you don't love me, if you like me, just do it. Right. Uh, anyway, but I appreciate it when you take the time to come by the podcast. And I'm really grateful for Josh uh, stopping in and, and spending some time with us. Uh, follow Josh on Twitter um, at Joshua Green. Um, and uh, again, check out The Rebels. Until next time, be safe, be well. God bless. <laughs>